Revelation chapter 17, which if you're new here or your first time, um, we don't always teach Revelation. <laughs> and, and this chapter is uh, very, very interesting. It's all about, uh, well, let's pray first. <laughs> Lord, we, we thank you for a beautiful day. We thank you for uh, that amazing thing called grace in our lives. Thank you for Jesus who gave himself for us and is coming back to receive us to himself. And Lord, we just ask that you would open your word and help us to push aside all the distractions in our heart and our mind and our world and just focus right now on being here and hearing from you and asking you to, Lord, continue the work you've begun in us. We're grateful for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Grab a seat if you would. This chapter deals with a woman, Revelation chapter 17, a beast, and the king of kings and the lord of lords. Those are the three main kind of characters within chapter 17. The woman is called or pictured as a harlot, the mother of harlots. She has that name. It's a false religion, a, 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 a faith, a, a religion that abandons truth and prostitutes itself, this faith does, this woman, for personal gain. So, so selling religion for personal gain is a picture of, of this, this harlot, this one world religion, an apostate religious system that opens its doors for power, for gain, for glory. A, a, a harlot which is contrasted really with Christ's church, the bride. The bride which is one day presented without spot, without wrinkle, pure, washed and clean by the blood of Jesus Christ, by, by the blood of the Lamb. So you have this, this person, this 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 really symbol of false religion at the end times in chapter 17. And then you have the beast, which is the Antichrist. And then you have the Lord of Lord and King of Kings, Jesus Christ himself, who will one day come and uh, defeat this crazy beast and this harlot of religious apostasy. And, and in this chapter, you know, the Bible describes a, a great city that was built after the flood of Noah, and the city was called Babel, and eventually became known as Babylon. And, and here's what the people said who built the city. You find the story in Genesis chapter 11. That they said, let us build ourselves a city. And it's a, it's a picture of intense human-centered, humanistic-centered control and cooperation. Let's build a tower, they said, number two, to, to reach to the heavens. And the picture is not just a tower. It's not like the Empire State Building or something like that. It's, it's, a, it's a human man-made religion. Let's, let's build our own way to heaven, so to speak. So let's build it together. Let's Let's have our own way to heaven. Let's, let's make a name for ourselves. There's this, this sense of achieving greatness. Look at me. Look what I've done. And so that we'll not be scattered. That's what they said. So that it'll be our way, not God's way. Every person, I believe, and I think Scripture teaches this and bears it out, was created to know the Lord to worship the Lord. But many worship a false god, and this is certainly the case as we make our way through the book of Revelation. Some follow a religious system of works and, and rules and, and think, well, if I keep all these rules and all these different kinds of religious activities, then I'll be okay. Some trust in 
the constellation or astrology or, or, or signs. In fact, that, that tower that would reach up to the heavens eventually became the ziggurats that, that worshiped the constellations and saw it kind of like their destiny from them, their, their signs, you know. Some people worship a God of their own creation, my God, my truth, my dream, my way, not God's way. Mahatma Gandhi said, I consider myself a Hindu and a Christian and a Muslim and a Jew and a Buddhist and a Confucian. I consider him total confusion. <laughs> Some people deny the fact that there is a creator, a designer, and they believe in evolution. That billions and billions and billions of years ago, a microorganism bumped into each other under a volcanic cesspool and evolved into Princess Diana, or you and me, or Mother Teresa. It's another false religion. And in our chapter, Revelation 17, we read about a false religion symbolized by a harlot a religious Babylon. Look at chapter 17, verse 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying, Come, I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornications. Well, one of the good things about this chapter is that it, it, it in many, time, many places, gives us the details for clarification of what it's talking about. If you, if you see there in, in verse 1 where it talks about this uh, many waters, and then you drop down to verse 15, it, it tells us what the waters are. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So, so the harlot that represents false religion and the waters are the multitudes, the nations, the, the different tongues and peoples. It's a, it's a picture, if you will, in, in Revelation chapter 17 of a worldwide false religion. And, you know, when I started reading through chapter 17, and it's a bizarre chapter, and I think I grabbed every commentary I could, and I read the chapter over and over and over. And, you know, there will be in the last days a worldwide false religion, and it'll be all about monetary gain and power. Now, when the rapture occurs, which we saw in chapter 4, and the true followers of Christ are removed, the world continues with religion. Church as usual. This is so bizarre, isn't it? So the, so the church is removed, but there's a lot out there that's not the church that thinks they are the church, and it'll stay. You will still have churches and prayers and songs and sermons. And, and the biggest lie of the enemy is false religion that you buy into something that makes you feel like you're holy or that you're saved or that you're okay because I did this act or I spoke this verse. And it's symbolized by a harlot. And that, that term is used four times in this chapter. And the idea and the meaning and, and the word harlot here is spiritual idolatry, that you somehow get pulled into the worship of not the one true God, but a false God. When, when Israel in the Old Testament had been spiritually unfaithful, and many times they were, they would drift into paganism or worshiping false gods. God said they were playing the harlot. In, in Hosea chapter 9, it says, Do not rejoice, O Israel, with joy like other peoples, for you have played a harlot against your God. You have made love for a hire on every threshing floor. They, they would go after false gods. 
And God saw this as going after a harlot, after something that, that, that wasn't real, that, that, was, that was all about self. The world will be enticed. The world will be seduced with the religion of the harlot, false religion. Be believers are called the bride of Christ. And, and they're, 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 they're that because of spiritual faithfulness. And to follow a false god or religion is spiritual perversion. And that's where this whole concept of harlot or mother of harlots, to, to play the harlot is to deny the one true God. And so that's what's happening here. There's, the, there's, this, there's this harlot and there's this beast, which is the Antichrist. Look at verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and, and was adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead was a name, and it was written, Mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots and of the abominations of earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. But the angel said to me, Why are you amazed? Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. She's sitting on a scarlet beast. It carried me away, and I, I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. The color reminds us of the, the fiery red dragon, Satan, who gives Antichrist his demonic power to rule over the world. So, so here is the great harlot, and the picture, the image is that she's being carried, sustained, or that she's being empowered, so to speak, by the Antichrist. This is not this harlot's first rodeo, so to speak, but this is the rodeo from Hades, sitting on the beast, riding the beast, empowered by the beast. And it's a, it's a, it's a one-world religion at the end times, along with, as we'll see in chapter 18, a one-world economy, one-world government. The harlot is dressed in purple, dressed in scarlet, gold cup, pearls. And, and the symbolism here is that this false religion, this this this. this faith that's being promoted around the world for every tongue and tribe is a, is a path for riches to the harlot. She's rich, but inside is abomination. Inside is blasphemy. L listen to verse 5. It says, And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. The, the word mystery in Scripture, it's not like you'll never figure this out. Mystery in the Bible means once it was unknown, once it was hidden, but now it's been revealed by God's Spirit and by God's Word. It was something that was hard to understand. Many times, truths in the Old Testament, they're said, well, this was a shadow of what was to come. Not fully understood, but now in the New Testament, been revealed. It's like on the day of Pentecost when, when, when Peter spoke, says, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Remember that in Acts, Acts chapter 2? But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. They, they didn't know what Joel was talking back in the Old Testament, but when the Holy Spirit came, he said, now, you're, now this is it. It's been revealed. The mystery is no longer a mystery. And Babylon... It's mentioned 300, over 300 times in the Bible. And the, the, the harlot isn't so much a specific location 
but a system that has always been and always will be opposed to God. It goes back once again to, to Genesis when this guy named Nimrod was, was founding the kingdom of Babylon. He was called the mighty hunter opposed to God. And in Hebrew, his name actually means, many scholars believe Nimrod means rebel. And you have that tower that's built, the great tower of Babel. And this was in defiance to, to God's instruction after the flood. I want you to spread across the earth and multiply, but instead they, they settle there and sought to establish themselves a life apart from God. Peter, in his first epistle, written from Rome in, in chapter 5, verse 13, says, She who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. Well, Peter wasn't in Babylon. He, he was in Rome when he wrote it. But what he's saying is that, that, that Rome was the same spirit, the same system, the same abomination at that time with all their many gods and all their desire to, to dominate and their, their Caesar-centered worship. That, that, that there was a code word for him to use for those who would be listening about the ungodly Roman Empire, an anti-God man-created system that permeates the world. And here in Revelation 17, you have this last day's harlot. It, it calls her, look what it calls her in verse 5. The, the mother of harlots. She, she, she is responsible for the martyrs and the tribulation time. I saw the woman, verse 6, drunk with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. It's, it's a religion that's anti-Christ, anti-Christian. And John is shocked and amazed. And listen to how it goes on here. The beast that you saw, it says in verse 8, and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition or destruction or waste. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was. This is, this is, the, this is the, the crazy part. The beast that was and is not and yet is. Here's the mind which has wisdom. In other words, you have to have spiritual understanding. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings, five fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he has come, he must continue a short time. This is like a, a, a riddle almost. The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and then does the seven and is going into waste or destruction, perdition. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for a short time or for one hour as kings with the beast. They're of one mind, and they'll give their power and authority to the beast. And these will make war with the lamb. And the lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, and the ten horns which you saw, these will hate the harlot and make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire, for God has put into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and give their kingdom to the beast or the Antichrist and to the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth." Okay, let's go home now. <laughs> wow. In the final 11 verses, we have a lot of information about the final days of tribulation. The beast that you saw, verse 8, was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to waste or perdition or destruction. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. The, the beast is the Antichrist who comes out of the pit. Perdition means destruction. The, the people who marvel or, or follow are the ones who have rejected God, turn 
away from the truth and the gospel. And it says their names are not found in the Lamb's book of life. Why are they amazed? It says he was, he was not, and then he is again. And in chapter 10, I mean chapter 13, we saw this verse about there was some kind of mortal wound to the head. There was some kind of assassination temp or something. And the mortal wound, he, he miraculously recovers in Revelation chapter 13, verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And the world marveled and followed the beast. It's kind of like a, almost like a false resurrection, a demonic imitation of Jesus, this beast, and people have rejected the true way, the true life, and the truth, and now they believe almost anything. P people reject the truth today. Basic common sense truth. It's amazing what's going on in our culture, in our society. People say uh, today, you, you know this is true, I can choose my own gender. Really? Yeah. As a preschooler. Now, now, how inane is this world becoming? That I, no matter what I biolog biologically am, I can choose my gender. I can disregard God's truth. I can disregard God's truth about same-sex marriage. This is a culture we live in, permeated with right now. I can just go ahead and choose that, that, that all those verses in Scripture that speak about same-sex marriage or speak about, you know, I created a man and woman, I can just ignore all that and do whatever I want to do. I can murder a child in the womb. It's okay. It's legal. I can get stoned every night. Now, when you were in the 60s, you couldn't do that legally. But more than now, you can it's everywhere you go. I can live with my boyfriend or girlfriend outside of marriage. It's okay. And, and, and here's what happens. This begins to permeate, not just the culture, but then into the church. I, I, was, I just spoke in a church last week up in, up in um, Baltimore. Uh, uh, a guy who was on staff here for five or six years, been up there 18 years. He came to me one Wednesday night after a service and said, hey, you started a church in your own hometown. I go, yeah. He goes, I'm going to move back to my hometown and start a church. I said, Rot's a ruck. <laughs> He's been there 18 years. And, and right now the church is beginning to really take off. And part of the reason it is is because people are coming out of all these very liberal churches that are teaching all this crazy stuff up in Baltimore. And they're going, wait a minute. That's not in the Bible. Amen. And they're flooding into his church and saying, this guy teaches the Bible. And they're coming to me and going, you know, we, we never were in a church like this before where they teach the Bible. I go, why? We didn't know it existed. Isn't that what the church is about, teaching the Bible? Amen. But, but we live in this saturated culture now that's afraid to speak up or say anything. And even the churches are embracing things that aren't true, that aren't even in the Scripture and lifestyles. And Christians are, are even getting to the place where, well, I probably shouldn't say anything. And, and, and in this passage, in this chapter we're looking at, chapter 17, you've got this, this one world religion that takes a foothold and the Christians are being martyred. A Greek, a, 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 a philosopher back in the 1800s, he lived from 1874 to 1836, a man named G.K. Chesterton a famous British apologist and philosopher. He says, when people say they do not believe in God, that, well, I don't believe in God, I kind of believe in nothing. He said, the fact is, they will almost believe in anything if it's presented to them correctly. And, and then you've got, this is where this chapter gets kind of dicey. Here is the mind, verse 9, which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. This calls for our mind, it says, of wisdom, the angel says. Or, or I would put it this way, that we, we need spiritual insight, clarity from above. We saw earlier seven heads and ten horns, and seven heads, many believe, represent seven hills. Verse 10 talks about seven kings. 
So it can be seen as, as Rome, many people say, that set on seven hills or seven kingdoms. If you've never seen the seven hills, these are the seven hills of Rome. I've only been to Rome one time. And those are the seven mountains or seven hills. But they typify, verse 10, seven kings or seven kingdoms. Five of these have passed off the scene, it says. One was present the time that John the Apostle is writing, and one is yet to come. Let, let's say the kings, we, we don't know who they are, but let's say it's Julius Caesar, Tiberius, Caliglia, Claudius, Nero, Domitian would be the sixth that's in charge of Rome at that time when John is writing this, and the Antichrist is to come. Our, our, our five kingdoms could be Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome during his time, and a future Roman Empire that would be a one-world government, so to speak. Are the, are the ten European states, they say, they are going to rise out and rise up during the time of the Antichrist. And verse 11, it says, The beast that was and is not is himself also the eighth and is of the seven. He's of the seven because he had the mortal wound and comes back as the eighth. And you've got the ten horns, which represent the ten kings that allow the beast to rise to power and then even give their power over to him, their influence. And it'll go to the end of the tribulation. Look at, look at verse 14. It says, there will, they will make war with the lamb. And the Lamb will overcome them, for he's the Lord of lords and the King of kings, and those who are with him are called chosen and faithful. They, they'll do all they can to defeat the Christians and, and the Lamb of God, and then he comes with his faithful, his chosen, the, the return of Christ, with the bride of Christ, defeats the harlot and the world religion. It's kind of like this passage, this prophetic passage in the Old Testament and I'll read it to you. I'm sure you've heard it. It's in the book of Psalm. I think it speaks of this time. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves as rulers and take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. We don't want to be inhibited or bound by this, this, this Christian mindset and their, 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 the truth that they embrace. Let's break their cords from us. He who sits in heaven, well, he'll laugh. And the Lord shall hold them in derision. And he'll speak to them in his wrath and distress them in deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. But blessed are all those who put their trust in him. The lamb of lamb, the king of kings, he comes and he defeats those who are opposed to him. And, and chapter uh, 17 of the book of Revelation it says, in the ten horns, verse 15, which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot and make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. There'll come a time when, when the beast, the Antichrist, will support this one world religion and, and carry it. And, and I think the reason is because it'll be economically uh, powerful and successful and bring so much money into the beast's coffers, so to speak. And, and then there'll come a time when he's done with the false religion and the beast will want to set himself up as God. You, you know the, the passage that talks about him. He'll do away with false religion and establish his own religion and set himself up as God in the temple that's going to be built in Israel. It's, it's, the, it's the great exposure of the false harlot. He'll expose her for who she really is, turn on her, 
and she's destroyed and rejected like yesterday's fake religion. It's a sham. And he'll, he'll, he'll turn on her just like the enemy turns on everybody. And, and just like he tries to deceive people in the fact that there is no real truth, that there is no real way, that there is no real life in Jesus, but there is. You know, we live in an interesting time when, when you can see the pendulum turning into a, 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 a time when people seem to want to embrace any and everything. In verse 14, it, it talks about, you know, this, this war with the Lamb. I believe what's being spoke of there is the Battle of Armageddon. You'll see it in more detail when we get to chapter 19. But, but here's, here's where it is in verse 18. And the woman who you saw is the great city which reigns over the king's of the earth. Not, not, the, not the, this, this, this religious Babylon, but in chapter 18, it turns into an economic system of the world. Wealth and luxury become the prize. This false counterfeit religion will be a worldwide seduction. And I don't know about you, but you can certainly see it coming. And that's why the scripture challenges us to stay grounded in the truth, Amen. to stay grounded in scripture, to, 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 to know the Bible. You know, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says this, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. I just want to do my thing. I just want to do whatever I want to do and believe whatever I want to believe. I, I want to do whatever I want to do materially, sexually. I, I want to do what I want to do. And this is so pervasive in our culture right now. Last days, Lovers of themselves. And then it says this, lovers of money. And this is a, such a predominant thing in the last days, and I think we're living in a time where it's all about that. Oh, I've got to have this much money. I've got to have this car. I've got to have this house. I've got to look this way. It's all about me and money. And some people can't get enough of money. You know, and there's all these echelons of money. And, and, and this is what's, what's happening. This is what goes on. And, and, and this is what Scripture tells us. They're proud. They're blasphemers. You know any proud blasphemers? Don't point to anybody. <laughs> but boy, is it rampant in, in, our, in our news. Is it rampant in our world? Lovers of themselves, proud, blas disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And they have a form of godliness, but they really have no of its power in their life. And he says, from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into the households and make captive gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And there's this amazing instruction, if you will, in Scripture to stay true to Scripture during these times that we're living in. All through First and Second Timothy. All dealing with the whole thing that goes on at the end times and why you and I are called to live out the scripture. It says in in First Timothy, now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demon, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from certain foods. For every creature of God is good, nothing is to be refused. And it says instruct people 
You'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith of the good doctrine which you've carefully followed, but reject profane and old fables. This is a faithful saying and worthy of acceptance. For this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. You know, I, I, I've been fortunate to come to Christ at a young age. 18 seemed seem old when I first came to the Lord. And now I can look back over some time which I can't even believe that my wife and I this November will be married 45 years, which is amazing to me. And I'm going to turn, I'm not going to tell you how old I'm going to be. <laughs> no, I will. No, I, yes, I will. In February, I'll be 70 years old. And so I, I'm thinking, how did that happen? <laughs> and it's not my fault. But, but, I, but I look back now over my, my Christian experience and I see the way that not only the culture has changed, but the way the church has changed and, and, and the teaching of Scripture. It's now amazing to people to come into a church like this where someone or some group is teaching verse by verse of the Bible. There's, there's, wow, I've never seen this before. And I'm like, what did your church do? Well, they kind of chose topics and they had little, you know, series on uh, movies and stuff like that. I go, what? Why? W was, this, was this not enough? Th th they want to be entertained with smoke and mirrors and all kinds of stuff. And you know what? If that's, your, if that's your gig, I guess it's okay. But in the end times, it says, be careful. And, and this whole chapter 17 of the book of Revelation is, is dealing with, with one day, you know, after the, after the church is gone, there will be this apostate one world religion that pretty much will embrace everything. And the driving force behind it will be this beast that carries it and supports it with a spirit of delusion. And it'll all be based around money and wealth and fortune. And, and people will buy into it because they, they'll feel like it'll also help them to be rich. And then one day it's exposed. And, and, and I say all that to say this. Make sure, make sure of your salvation, number one. That it's based in the truth of the gospel. That Jesus Christ who loved you. You know, I was listening to those kids. What is a pastor? I was thinking to myself, a pastor is, is a guy who... Um, got saved and was given the, the assignment of teaching the scripture because God knew if he didn't give it to them, they'd probably fall away. And he needed to stay in the Bible more than anybody else. <laughs> That's been my case. So God, why did you ask me to do this? He goes, John, I knew you needed to be in the scripture every day and, 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 and people know who you are so you have to live a certain way can't be doing this and that because oh I thought he was a pastor so the pastor is somebody who has a short leash <laughs> because he needs it Amen. but you know what we all need it Amen. and we all need to have the truth spoken to us over and over and over again and especially in the day and the time that we live. And Revelation 17, even though the church is gone, there'll be Christians, but, but the enemy uh, will, will, it says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus Christ. And that, that's, that's going to be what goes on when this one world religion, you know, crops up and these people are opposed to the way, the truth, and the life, which is Jesus Christ. And, you know, even, you know, my, my wife and I were just up in Baltimore. We had some time together. And, you know, I'm ta talking to her. She's talking to me about Revelation chapter 17. She goes, John, that's some crazy stuff. I go, I know. She said, well, we won't be here. I said, I know. But for those who are going to be here and for those who, 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 who read this, these passages of Scripture, it begins to help us not only no, we need to share the gospel with other people, but to recognize the times that we're living in and the truth that's being so trampled underfoot. 
I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. This, this counterfeit religion will be a worldwide seduction. That's why they call her the mother of harlots. She seduces people with a false religion and a false sense of security. And then at the end, she's exposed. Aren't you glad that the Lord Jesus Christ came to you, knocked on the door of your heart, and drew you to himself? Amen. And that he's given you his word. And I would encourage you and I'd encourage me, let it keep you on a short leash. Amen? Amen.